An insightful statement regarding the matter of a proportional canon is Plato's declaration in Philebus that if one were to remove from any of the arts the elements of arithmetic, proportion, and weight, what would remain of each would be negligible indeed. Also in that book, Plato writes at some length on proportion and measure. For example, Measure and proportion are everywhere identified with beauty and virtue. Also, beauty, proportion, and truth, considered as one, gives rise to the good. Plato mentions painters who contemplate transcendent truth first, and then establish in this world the laws of the beautiful, the just, and the good. This statement would apply to sculptures as well. For Plato, the transcendent truth would involve divine archetypes, including essential elements of mathematics, and the laws would also involve mathematics as seen from his quotations above. Overall, these statements show the moral and philosophical importance that the mathematical nature of the canon would have conveyed to Plato less than a century after the canon was written. The literary testimonia on the canon and the Roman sculptural copies indicate a combined application of contemporary Hippocratic surgical texts and close empirical observation of the human body. The canon applied two distinct models of proportion, consistent with Pythagorean philosophy, for its composition and the lengths of body parts. 1. One-to-one -one balancing of opposites from the isonomia theory of health, and 2. The ratios of commensurate but unequal lengths of musical harmony. Some insight into the proportional relationships in the canon is provided by a testimonia by Galen referencing the texts of Chrysippus of Soli, circa 280 to circa 207 BCE, and ultimately Polycletus. For Chrysippus showed this clearly in the statement from him quoted just above, in which he says that the health of the body is identical with due proportion in the hot, the cold, the dry, and the moist. For these are clearly the elements of bodies. But beauty, he thinks, does not reside in the proper proportion of the elements, but in the proper proportion of the parts, such as, for example, that of finger to finger, and all these to the palm and base of hand, of those to the forearm, of the forearm to the upper arm, and of everything to everything else, just as described in the canon of Polycletus. For having taught us in that work all the proportions of the body, Polycletus supported his treatise with a work of art, making a statue according to the tenets of the treatise and calling it, like the treatise itself, the canon. So then all philosophers and doctors accept that beauty resides in the due proportion of the parts of the body. This description provides a clearer picture of the canon by describing it as a set of proportions of successive body parts. If A, B, C represent the lengths of the successive parts of the body described in the quotation, then the corresponding proportions in the canon are A to B, B to C. In Vitruvius's description of a canon, the lengths and heights of body parts are given as fractions of the total height and face height, rather than proportions of successive parts of the body. However, both mathematical expressions have an underlying equivalency. For example, for Vitruvius, the head height is one-eighth of the total height, and the forearm height is one-quarter which form a ratio of 1 to 2 to 8 for the ratio of the head height to the forearm length to the total body height. 
also beauty residing in due proportion of the parts and whole of the body is in accord with the quotations from Plato given earlier in Vitruvius's description of a canon. As noted earlier, the Polycleitan Testimonia appear to be applying or closely related to Pythagorean wordings and conceptions. The figurate numbers were one of the important features of Pythagorean mathematics. The figurate numbers, as implied by their name, formed various shapes such as triangles, squares, and oblong rectangles. These shapes and their figurate or mnemonic numbers may have helped form the shapes dictated by the canon. A conceptual link between the mnemonic numbers and the crafts is the gnomon, the set square used by artisans. They were in an L and cross shape. Also, in the figurate number for the decad, 10, we note the musical ratios of the octave, 1 to 2, 5th, 2 to 3, and 4th, 3 to 4, formed by the successively paired rows. These musical ratios were investigated by Pythagoras on the monochord, also known in Greek as the canon. Thus, the Pythagorean theory of figurate numbers and the associated ratios from their construction may have provided a suitable and attractive theory for Polycleitus to apply in his canon. In the history of Western culture, the canon of Polycleitus became an exemplar for accuracy and the harmonious relations of the constituent parts to the whole in wide-ranging endeavors in art, medicine, science, and engineering. In our own time period, we are surrounded by the heritage and vestiges of the canon of Polycletos and its numerical order, akin to the Pythagorean philosophy, that involved the sizing and proportioning of the human body and face, life drawing, ergonomics, reconstructive and cosmetic surgery and dentistry, clothing and fashion, to name a few. We observe the great popularity and adulation of youthful and attractive fashion models, movie stars, and athletes. This fascination arises from a long biological, social, and cultural history of humanity. Additionally, for the mystic, the perfection sought and created in the world is a remembrance and projection of divine archetypes, you may have noticed, for example, that it is harder to estimate the age of a person who is extremely attractive. To the Platonist, the reason is that that person's outer form is relatively close to matching the divine and timeless archetype. Back of the supermodel is the supermodel, the canon of Polycleitus. Behind the perfect ten is the perfect ten, the decad of the Pythagorean philosophy and the Vitruvian canon. We see in the fads and pursuits of popular culture the outer husk of the inner kernel that is truly longed for, the wisdom bespoken of by the Pythagoreans and the canon. While the sculptures of the Doriferous and others like it are renowned in the history of art, at best, they direct us beyond history, which is a construction based on the necessary illusion of time. The inspiration behind these statues, closely akin to the Pythagorean philosophy out of which these works manifested, is directly available to us in the intuitive and meditative experience of the eternal now in eternity. As great as the beauty of these works is, they at best point us to the much greater beauty and perfection that has always been within us and to which our outer nature will be greatly ennobled by recognizing and heeding throughout life. The canon in these works of art can help convey to us the inherent nobility of the God within us and our capacity to be a co-creator with God in the image of God 
directing assertively and harmoniously our affairs and environment.